Well, I'm excited to be continuing in our series in the book of Philippians. Uh, so if you, if you haven't already, open your Bible or a Bible app to the book of Philippians. We're in the end of chapter 1. One of the things that we've been talking about in this 2020 vision series, Seeing Clearly to Press On, uh, is that as we enter the year 2020, uh, this could be a vision for 2020, the year, but it's, it's beyond that. It affects every day for as many years as the Lord gives us breath, and it's really thinking about eyesight. Seeing clearly is imperative to follow Jesus well as we pursue Christian maturity. But different from, from physical eyesight, spiritual sight requires that everyone wear gospel lenses. If we were to survey the room, uh, it would be obvious to many, those who need glasses or lenses. Uh, some of you, however, have opted for contacts. And so we wouldn't know at the outset who actually needs glasses, who needs help to see more clearly. But one thing that can be true, that is true of every single human, is that if we are to see clearly in this life, every person needs gospel lenses. We all need the help of the Word of God to be able to see that we on our own are in desperate need of a Savior, and that that Savior is, in fact, Jesus Christ. As we look in this book, and as we look uh, through, through these gospel lenses, it helps us to see that uh, we can see the Lord in all of His brilliant detail. I love First Peter, uh, or Second Peter 1, that talks about the fact that we have received everything that we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who has called us to his own glory and goodness. There's a head knowledge we need, and then there's an experiential knowledge that we need. You might know in your mind that the Lord provides everything, but until you are um, destitute may be a strong word, but you don't know how you're going to pay a particular bill, we have an option, whether we're going to run to our own course of action or whether we're going to wait on the Lord and trust the Lord to provide for that particular need. And as the Lord provides that need for you, now you have an experiential knowledge. So there's a head knowledge and there's an experiential knowledge that we need all of these things. It's sort of a, a double entendre. You think about that phrase uh, through, um, through the knowledge of Christ Jesus our Lord. And that's head knowledge and heart knowledge, experiential knowledge, as we flesh out or walk out our faith. But as we do that, we see the Lord now experientially as our provider. Not in sort of this abstract, theological, philosophical conversation. He's not just the provider, but he's, well, he's my provider. He's not just the one who brings compassion, but he is my compassionate friend. He is just, he is not simply the, the owner of all truth, but he is the one who has revealed himself to me. To every human on this planet through creation and to everyone who will open this book and read his word, very specifically, he has revealed himself because he's a loving God. So we will see the Lord in all of his brilliant detail, certainly not all at once, but we will see him the more that we dive into the word of God. And secondly, we will see ourselves with clarity, with the clarity that the Holy Spirit then uses to take God's word and, and I love what they say in the end of Acts when Peter is preaching the gospel and he's telling their kind of spiritual lineage history. And at the end of this, they say, what do we need to be, do to be saved? But there's an editorial note in there. They were, it, some translations say they were pierced to the heart or they were pricked in their hearts. And when I'm praying for people who I, I think may not know the gospel, of course, I don't know their hearts. But when I'm praying for people in that, say, in that state, one of the things I say is, Lord, would you prick their hearts with the gospel? Pierce through the facade, pierce through the armor that they have and prick their heart with the truth of your word that is ultimately love. And so we need to maybe gain for the first time this perspective of ourselves. You may be in here this morning thinking you're doing just fine in life, thinking that your solution to the, the problems that you've faced is found within yourself. That's what everyone around you wants to tell you. That's what everything in our world wants to tell you, that the answer is found within yourself. 
But that's not true. The answer is not found within yourself. It's found outside of yourself in the person of Jesus who died on the cross for you because he loves you. And when we, we turn from self to the Lord, then, then we're told that, oh, now the Holy Spirit does come to live within us. But So what we find within us is really the Spirit of God who then indwells us. But it's not until we repent, we, we, we turn away from our sin and we turn to the Lord, that then the Lord begins to indwell us. And we begin to gain a perspective that is heavenly or otherworldly, to press on, straining toward what lies ahead for us in heaven. So today we're in our third week uh, looking at the Apostle Paul's letter to the Philippians. And if you just remember, this is a church. We looked at Acts 16 of how the Lord began to formulate that church. We don't have time to revisit it this morning, but, but go look at Acts chapter 16, the second half. I, I think it's verses 6, six through the end or 16 through the end. So yeah, six, 6 through the end. And you'll see three phenomenal stories of individuals that the Lord worked in their lives. These are, these are the folks that the Lord used to begin this church at Philippi. We saw in week one that our identity and our union with Christ helps us or allows us to know who we are. And, and Paul said he is thank, thankful, and it's rooted in God's faithfulness. It's thankfulness that motivates us to pray for and work toward increasing and maturing love for God and his glory. And last week we saw that as followers of Christ, we find our greatest joy through self-sacrificing service. Christ-centered ministry. In fact, Paul wanted so much to go home and be with the Lord. He says, I don't know what to decide. I love the Lord so much. And my body is spent, paraphrasing. And I want to go be with the Lord. But I see what's more necessary. That I remain here with you for your progress and joy in the faith. So it means fruitful labor for Paul. Christ-centered ministry is fruitful labor. It doesn't always feel fruitful, but it's the Lord who brings the fruit. Self-sacrificing Christ-centered ministry works for others, progress and joy in the faith. And as we do that, we see that begin to be true in our own lives. It's a very different perspective from thinking about Oak Grove Church or another church and thinking, how can the church serve me? Now, that's not an invalid question. We want to ask questions like, is the word of God preached? Um, you know, is my family able to grow in this church? But, but the questions, if you answer yes to those questions, very quickly, the, 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 the perspective needs to change and then begin to say, how can I actively contribute to the progress and joy of the faith for everyone who is a part of my church or those that the Lord would connect me with, right? We can't all be responsible for everyone, but you can. You can make a self-sacrificing self decision to disciple one individual. Well, I don't know how. Well, then we'll disciple you as you disciple them. We'll come alongside you. We'll equip you. It will not be for lack of resourcing available for you. And so we need to have our perspective changed in this regard. Today, we finished uh, Philippians chapter 1, looking at verses 27 through 30. And this section is, is as you'll find uh, in these letters, very tightly, tightly connected to the previous section. Paul talks about the fact that it's sort of a checklist, if you will, right? Paul's talking about, okay, so, so here's my checklist. Here's my to-do list. My to-do list is one, to remain for your progress in the faith. I want to go home and be with Jesus, but I know that God has me here for your spiritual growth. So I'm convinced of this, and so I will remain. And then in this section we look at today, he gives the Philippians a checklist. He says, live in a manner worthy of the gospel. More literally, uh, behave as citizens of heaven. So there's a checklist for Paul. There's a checklist or a to-do for the church at Philippi. As he talks about what it means to live the worthy life. Read with me in Philippians 1. I'm going to begin back at verse 21 so that we can more tightly see the connection. 
Paul says this phrase that we know well, for, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live on in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I cannot tell. I'm, I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and to be with the Lord. For that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Don't miss that. And so convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. And we pick up here today. Only let your life be worthy of, Let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict you saw that I had, and now hear that I still have. I'd like to pray together before we continue. Father, I'm so thankful for your word. Because my confidence in preaching is not based on uh, my wit or, or my ability My confidence is on the authority that your word has. Our confidence in listening well is in the authority and in the wisdom and in the the fact that your word is alive. It's not a textbook, though there's a lot that that we learn that, that instructs our minds. But it is, in fact, life. And so we read it and it cuts. And sometimes that's a good cutting and we're receptive and we're ready to put it into practice. And Lord, I I stand at the front of the line to say that I don't always want the cutting or the revelation that comes to my heart when I receive your word. On a grand scale, I know I do, but in the moment, it just is painful. In the moment, it brings fear. Not because it's fearful, but because I am so short-sighted so often. I, we, often cling so tightly to the things that we want, the things that we feel make us comfortable. And you remind us here today that we're citizens of heaven, not called to be comfortable on earth. We need a wartime mindset, not a vacation mindset. And so to that end, Father, we pray that you would help us. Lord, that the cutting that happens here today would would be from your word through the Holy Spirit for your people and specific enough to help each and every one of us know exactly how we need to walk out of here today. Some may know more specifically, some may, may not and may need more time in prayer and reflection this week asking you to unveil, to, to pull the scales off of our eyes, their eyes, so that, that we know exactly how we are to put this passage into practice. We depend on you, we look to you, we rest in you. And even as we find ourselves engaged in this struggle, we thank you. We thank you that our relationship with you depends not on how well we perform, but on how well Jesus performed, which is perfectly. And we can rest in that. And follow you in faith by your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want you to notice the word only at the beginning of this passage. Only let your life, your manner of life, be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now, now don't rush over that word only too often. I want to encourage you to see that this is a specific point that he is making. 
This is not a conditional statement. That is very important. It's very important to recognize this. He says, I I desire to go and be with the Lord because that is far better for to die is gain. But to live is Christ because I know that that remains fruitful labor for me as I stay and I minister to you. Only let your life, manner of life, be worthy of citizens of of, of heaven. Let your, your manner of life be worthy of the gospel. So what he's saying is this, I know and I have decided because of the work of the Spirit of God in my life that I will remain. So let's make it worth it. Let's spend our lives for the kingdom of heaven and, and, and you make my staying worth it. You make my investment in your life worthy of the gospel of Christ as you live and move as, as, as citizens of heaven. Only let your life, your manner of life, be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come to you or I am absent, I may hear that you are standing firm. Colossians 1.13 says that, uh, that he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and has transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. A few verses early in, in, in verse 6, he says that he, God, who began a good work in you to the church. That's like a y'all. He who began a good work in y'all, the church. He who began a good work in y'all will, be, uh, will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. But he says, your greatest priority in every decision is to live as heavenly citizens. He's echoing what Jesus said in Matthew 5, a city, you are the light of the world. A a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Paul has this bookend effect. You'll notice a lot of what happens in chapter 1 also happens in chapter 4 in the book of Philippians. He says in Philippians, or, or in this case, 3 verse 20, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, every decision that you and I make is to be influenced by the fact that you and I fly the flag of Jesus Christ. Why is this his focus? Pay attention to what he says in verse 27. So that. Whether I come, whether I come and see you or whether I am absent, I may hear that you are standing firm. Well, how are we to stand firm? Well, we're to stand firm in one spirit and in one mind. Church, we're to be unified. Do you know that a whole lot of what happens in ministry is subjective? A whole lot of what happens in church ministry is subjective. But there are some things that are that are rock solid, black and white. And they're gospel issues. The fact that our our priority is not to be comfortable with who we are as a church. We're, we're, we're We're to be continually pressing outward, moving outward in our circles of influence, influence, loving those that we come in contact with, not telling them that they need to behave like citizens of heaven before they actually become citizens of heaven. We love people. We build relationship with people. We welcome them in here regardless of what they look like. And I'll tell you, church family, I'm thankful for the many, many times I have heard people say that Oak Grove Church is a very, very welcoming church family. And that is true. But there's also a challenge in here for us because it is very easy, and I don't, I don't want to take any credit away from y'all. It's really not yours, right? It's really not ours. It's the Lord who works in us and through us to do his will. But it's much easier to become a friendly, welcoming church. And then after a few Sundays, it can actually become very lonely in a church that's welcoming as people enter in but then aren't exactly sure where to go or what to do or or how to connect or how to get embedded in relationship. Which is why we try to form smaller pockets of community around the church. And they may look like different things. It may be a men's group or a ladies group or a journey group or a community group or somebody that is engaged in ministry together. It it can look like like a lot of different things, but our goal is to help people become more embedded in relationship. Because where we find friends who are on the same mission that we are, we will, we're more likely to stay connected and, 
and committed. And so that's important for us. We need to be standing firm in one spirit as a church. You're going to have a dis- disagreement with how I try to go about something. I may have a disagreement with how you're, about to, you're, you're going about something. And as we do that, we need to filter these things through a grid of priority, a grid of importance. Is it just a matter of my opinion and your opinion? Because if that's the case, I need to, I need to hold this with open hands. I don't need to to close my grip tightly on something that is important for me because I think it ought to be done in that certain way unless it's a gospel issue. If it's a gospel issue, friends, we will in Christ fight until the day is over because we need to always be fighting and contending for the faith. But as we do ministry together, there's an ebb and flow to what we do and how we do. There may be some years we're engaged in one ministry and then in, 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 in over the course of time that ministry may change because life changes and circumstances change. And I'll tell you as I'm preaching this right now, I don't have any particular issue on my mind. I genuinely do not have any particular people in my mind. If you're sitting here thinking, oh, he's talking to me, I'm kind of frustrated that he's talking at me. I'm not. Maybe the Holy Spirit is. I don't know. What I know is that we are to be standing firm in one spirit. I want you to hear what Gordon Fee says. He makes a very compelling case that this is the Holy Spirit. He says the Philippians are to stand firm in the same sphere. That is the sphere of the, of the, the, uh, the MO of the Holy Spirit. Right? Ephesians 4, 1 through 3 is a very, very close parallel there, there as Paul calls the Ephesians to live in a manner worthy of their calling as Christians by being eager to maintain the oneness or the unity that is produced by the Spirit of God. One of the things, I, many of you know I grew up an Air Force brat and moved, uh, I've lived in a lot of different uh, states and a couple countries. And um, one of the things that I'm so thankful for is in the different places I've lived, I have found very, very close kinship in the body of Christ. Everywhere I've gone. It's not because I'm that great. I mean, I know you guys might think that, but, uh, you know, I, no, I, 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 have, I have. I have close friends uh, in many, many places in the country. And it's not just about me. I have friends that I consider deeply, deeply close brothers and sisters in Christ in several states. Because of the unity that comes through the Holy Spirit. So we're to stand firm in one spirit with one mind. And we are to be striving also in chapter 4 verse 3. Striving for the faith. We're to be striving together. We're to be pulling together. And so what do we do? Well, we relinquish some of our opinions. We relinquish some of our perspectives as long as it's not a gospel perspective. Why? Why? Well, because we're not here to get our own way. We're here to get God's way. We're here to minister to one another, and we're here to reach the world with the gospel of Christ Jesus. Paul says in Philippians 4, 1, Therefore, my my brothers, whom I love and I long for, my joy and my crown stand firm, thus in the Lord, my beloved. We're not to be frightened by anything. We're not to be intimidated in anything by your opponents. Looking at verse 29 and following here. Standing firm in one spirit and not frightened. Opposition can cause us to second guess our decisions or our convictions, even if only momentarily. Have you ever been engaged in a conversation with someone and you begin talking about spiritual things and you begin talking about the Lord and then the conversation sort of moves through this kind of funnel-like process, right? We begin to understand a bit of who they are, right? What's their, what's the, what are their presuppositions? What do they believe to be true about life? Even if they may not know it, we have these uh, high-level kind of loose conversations and, and then we begin to hone in a little bit more and it may happen in one conversation, Uh, it, It may happen over several conversations and sometimes over several years. But as we begin to funnel down and we begin to get to the heart of the issue, we begin to talk about Christ and the fact that because of our sin, every one of us needs Jesus. And they say, do you mean to tell me that Jesus is the only way to heaven? And all of a sudden, we're kind of like, oh, you put it like that. I mean, for, for a moment, there, there, there might be a hesitation. Oh, that, that does sound kind of exclusive. 
Oh, that does. Do you find yourselves in that moment on your heels, all of a sudden beginning to play defense and more concerned that they like you? I'm not giving uh, carte blanche freedom here for saying it doesn't matter if they like you or not. Just tell them the truth and don't be caring. No, no, there's, there's none of that here. There's none of that in the, in the gospel. But all of a sudden, we, we feel a little bit defensive because we face opposition. I love what Chelsea said about those who are opposing them on Facebook. The first thing that they do is they pray. Before they formulate a response, and what happens? The anger that's there begins to be morphed into grief. Now, don't get me wrong. There, there's, an appropriate, there's an appropriate ideological anger for those who are manipulating for those who are, who are taking advantage of those who are unable to defend themselves, those who are too young to, to know any different, and they're, 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 they're moved, they're tossed to and fro by the wind and waves of the doctrine of the world. And there is a righteous anger there, but in every individual in whose eyes we look, the gospel lenses help us see beyond the argument to what may be going on in their Heart. So how do you deal with these doubts, this, this second guessing as you face opposition? We may think that our, our, our mission is to make money, or to raise nice kids, quote unquote, who are contributors to society, we might think. We might think that our, 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 our mission on this life is to work hard, to show ourselves as reliable because our reputation is on the line. Well, that depends on your motive. Is it about your reputation that you're concerned of, or, or is it about the reputation of the Lord, which is why Colossians tells us, well, we work for the Lord, not for men. We want to be kind to others. And again, I would say, yes, but motive is everything. Jesus was not necessarily nice. He was kind, tenderhearted, and compassionate, but always with an aim to speak the truth in love to others. Our mission, friends, is to be bravely, courageously striving side by side for the gospel with one another. We've got to be striving with one another because we're going to find opponents. We're going to offend folks who disagree. And we should not be surprised by that. One, one of my sisters has a a great mindset about a lot of things she's encountered in life. When we were in high school, she was making pretty good choices, and, well, I wasn't. And she had determined in her mind beforehand, if I'm presented with this challenge, this temptation, here's what I'm going to do. She was determined to follow Christ. Do you realize that, that in your hands you hold the answer to life? You're going to come into contact with people and the Lord's already at work in their heart and it just seems easy in a sense. They're just looking for the answer. The Lord has prepped them and you get to tell them. In other instances, you're going to share the gospel. You're going to, you're going to communicate your heart's desire for them. They may not be ready to hear it. They may not ever. But they may be several days, weeks, months, or years down the road. And Chelsea's message is really the message of the gospel, and it hits home for me. Because there were some years in high school where I was a follower of Jesus, not engaged as a citizen of heaven. I wasn't behaving as a citizen of heaven. I got into a relationship that was not a Christ-like relationship. And adults, if you'll follow me here, on the other side of every pregnancy is a man. And I was that man for my girlfriend. And all of a sudden, I was overwhelmed and swept by the fact that I had allowed my desire for an easy life on earth. An easy season of life for myself. Relationship. Relationship that wasn't according to God's design, but that was according to my design to color my entire perspective. I had gospel lenses as a follower of Jesus, but I took them off. 
because I was focused on myself. Friends, we are either striving for the gospel or we are walking away from the gospel because anytime we drift, we never drift toward Jesus. We drift in complacency and we drift away from the Lord. And I was drifting. In fact, I was paddling. And I found myself in this situation. I say found myself. Caused. This very, very painful situation and circumstance. I remember, I remember sitting with my mom in our kitchen. And she just was weeping. She wasn't hateful. She wasn't spiteful. She was grieving. And she sat there weeping. And so what did I do? Well, it was my fault she was weeping. So I, I put my arm around her and I thought I would comfort her. And you know, my mom sort of pushed me away, but not in an unkind or in an unloving manner. What she communicated was, a hug won't fix this. We make decisions, friends, and, and as we make decisions, we think that, well, we can come back and we can capture it and redirect it. And by God's mercy, we can at times. But many times, the words that come, the actions that proceed from our lives cannot be redirected immediately or often even by us. And my mom went on to tell me how much she loved me. How much the Lord loved me? But a side hug wasn't going to fix it. Wasn't going to solve it. And I knew that was true. And so she had an abortion. And in that context, as we were sort of... Uh, I want to be cautious in how I say this. Because at that point, we were striving to counsel her and her family not to move forward with an abortion. I say cautious because it would be wrong for me to paint them as the ones who are wrong and me as us as the ones who are right or righteous because my sin got us into the mess. So I just want to, I feel like I need to say that carefully for you. For me. And as we had conversations with her parents, as I began to lay out a case, as I began to plead, please don't do this. She said, you're a hypocrite. And I said, you're right. Because I was. Many years later, I got a phone call in college uh, from my ex-girlfriend. And she shared that the Lord had used some folks in her life to get a hold of her heart. I want to tell you, I both grieve and I spill over with gratitude. Because you see, I had a gospel opportunity in that, what began as a friendship. And I squandered that opportunity. I squandered that opportunity because I was focused on the here and the now and myself. But God in His mercy is faithful. God is faithful when we are faithless. Now that can never be a license to do what we want to do. But what it ought to do is always help our confidence in God and in His purposes to soar. And she repented. She confessed Jesus as her Savior and was walking in that moment in faith-filled obedience, growing as a new believer. 
And she needed to call me because she felt like that was part of what she needed to work through in her following Christ. And the Lord allowed just a wonderful, it's the last conversation we've had. Why do I say, I got to tell you friends, I, I debated, I prayed, I agonized over what to share with you today because like I said earlier, I, I'm very nervous that any of that would come across like I was arguing for the right thing because the only reason I could have been is because I had put us in a situation that would have required it. So why say it? I thank the Lord that this text came on this day. Because in those moments, I ceased striving for the right one. And I was living as an earthly citizen. I wasn't standing firm with my youth group for the faith. And I had an opportunity to go on a short mission trip after that. And there was a season when I was standing out in a... In a, in a um, fire escape, an old, old building, I don't think some da guy dangerous fire escape, just, I just was out on this really wide old building in Chicago fire escape. And as I was praying, I just needed to be alone. My youth group was gracious. They were supportive. They were, uh, they were, they wanted to be available. And I just kind of needed some space to myself. And I went outside and I prayed one of the best prayer times I've ever had in my entire life with the Lord. And as they were looking for me and they couldn't find me, somebody realized where I was. And and in this, this L-shaped hotel, I saw this kind of plant that was kind of moving in the window, and I didn't think much of it until I realized that, that my youth group had lined up two by two in every window. They knew that I needed to be alone. They weren't coming out to comfort. They, weren't, they just said, let's just pray for the guy. And that's what they did. They prayed. And I would not have told you this at the time because I had no idea. But in that moment, the Lord gripped my heart for the local church. It was far from a perfect youth group. Well, our youth group does ah, Youth group's just like church. Got our strengths. Got our weaknesses. It's the Lord Jesus who holds us together. But friends, in verse, I think it's 29... Paul says, it has been granted to you that for the sake of Jesus, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Do you hear that? I want you to catch it. I know we're, I know we're wrapping up here, and we are, in case you're wondering, but I, I want you to catch this. I, I, you have to catch this. We must catch this vision. It has been granted to you. If you can go to the next slide, it's like a certificate. <laughs> You've been given a certificate to believe and to suffer for Christ. Don't be surprised by it. Welcome it. Don't, don't create it because of an obstinate perspective or manner. But welcome it. Thank the Lord that a servant is not greater than his master. That you are counted worthy as a child of God to suffer opposition, funny looks, being ostracized, being picked on, even physically injured. As Christians in the world, even today, are being persecuted for their faith. You have been graciously granted the privilege of believing and suffering for his sake. Because why? 30, we're engaged in the same conflict that we saw Paul had and, and realize that he still has as he pens this letter from a cell. If we are to have 2020 gospel vision and see clearly to press on. We need to be engaged in the ministry that God has for us. 
And I don't know what that means for you. There are uh, over 120 or 30 people in this room. So what does that mean for you? I don't know. But what I would ask you to do is take it to the Lord and ask the Lord. He is faithful. He will tell you each and every time what it is that you need to be doing. But I will say there are times when it's just easier to gripe about our church or gripe about our pastor or gripe about our friend than strive side by side with the one who is only next to you because the Holy Spirit unites you. That's gospel friendship. That's fellowship in the gospel. And that's why Paul started this letter by saying, oh, I'm so thankful for you. As we celebrate communion, it is a celebration there may be a somber component to this as you think about and you reflect on your own sin, but we don't, we're not ever left to stay there because in Jesus, we push forward through that to thanksgiving. We remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. We look around ever thankful for the brothers and sisters, old and young, that God has placed around us. We give thanks and we remember and we look forward as we press on together. Father, we love you. We're so thankful for who you are, for what you've done on our behalf. Lord, you have a vision for our church family. You have a direction for our church family. And, and, and I don't always know every detail of it. The elders don't always know every detail of it. The deacons don't know every detail of it. Even as members of the body of Christ, we don't know exactly how it's supposed to flow, exactly what it's supposed to look like. And so we, we do our best and we pray and we seek you and we work together and sometimes we get in one another's way. But wait, may we not get in yours? I mean, even as I pray that I know that nothing will get in your way. Nothing will prevail against your plan. And we thank you for that, Lord. We praise you for that. And Father, we pray and we ask you boldly to do a work at Oak Grove Church, to do a work at other churches in our community that are proclaiming your name of saving souls. We don't want to see people just bouncing between churches. We want to, we want to see you using our lives and our lips and our mannerisms as children of the gospel, citizens of heaven, speaking and bringing life to people around us for your sake and for your glory. Lord, may we go to heaven spent, not retired, but engaged until the day you call us home. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.